Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, a little discovery that I made at the QPCR 2011 Congress in Munich, Germany this year. Uh, it's a company called Nebion, and they've created a, a, um, a suite of application tools, one of which is called, um, called Gene Investigator. And one of the tools that they've created, which is really useful for people doing QPCR, is called RefGenes. So what this company did, actually, is they is they, over the past seven years, they've combined the entire uh, or a large portion of the public repository of microarray data that's been deposited in public repositories, and they've brought it all together into one big relational database where they actually really reworked the data to clean the data up, um, make it all uniform with uh, uniform annotations, parsings, to make the data actually very easily accessible to biologists around the world so we can look uh, at our own genes of interest to determine um, how our genes behave under a variety of different conditions that have already been tested by investigators using microarrays. One of the applications is how stable uh, genes are under particular experimental conditions where we can choose uh, use that stability data to determine reference genes for our own experiments. So the, um, the reference gene tool is available here, www.refgenes.org slash rg slash. And if you go there, you'll get this window. So you, the first thing you do, obviously, is you click Start. So now it's starting the application. I'm just, so now, uh, hopefully, you can see this. I'm sharing this application here. So when you open RefGenes, the initial thing that it's going to do is go through an initial processing step. It starts off by looking at the entire human, uh, um, well, a, a subset of microarrays from the, from the human microarray database that it carries. It's a very simple tool to use. So you start here by selecting the microarray that you're interested in. So you click on this plus sign up here. You click New Selection, and you click on the organism that you're working with. So we have all kinds, Arabidopsis, uh, Drosophila, there's E. coli, Homo sapien, obviously, there's mouse, there's rat. So most, many of the organisms that we work traditionally with in labs are available here. I'm going to go to the human one. The next step is the array type. It's recommended to choose the high uh, the, the high arrays first, the large arrays. Um, if your gene of interest isn't available in the large array, then, then you can work your way into the other arrays. But start with the large array. And leave this as the default. And then just go straight down to select arrays by annotations. So we click on that. And this again, the screen, it's going to take some time for the next screen to come up. So this is, uh, this is a bit of a waiting period. And it's because it's going into the human array uh, subset of the database, and it's going through all the annotations, sorting everything to look at all the data. And this is uh, several, um, several uh, parallel processing um, uh, servers that are working together to make all this happen behind the scenes. It takes up a huge amount of, um, of processing capacity to, to produce just this screen that we see here now. We can select arrays by annotation. Now, I recommend that you just minimize all the screens except anatomy and just choose by anatomy where you want to go. So what you want to choose are anatomies that have at least 50 microarrays. If they don't have 50 microarrays, like this one here, activated lymphocyte, you can choose related, um, related um, anatomies to get up to 50 arrays, or even you can choose, you can combine some to get up to 50 or more than 50. So if we just work our way, our way down, you can see there are many, many different uh, anatomies here. It's a huge list that you can go through to try and find the closest anatomy to the types of experiments that you're, that you're working on. And, um, and hopefully you'll find, uh, you'll be able to find uh, anatomies that have uh, approximately 50, array, 50 arrays in them. So there's, there's all kinds of anatomies here. There's hundreds. 
So, um, so you can, you know, use use whatever whatever anatomy you wish. We could look at uh, look at this one, melodysplastic syndrome, as an example. I'm just randomly clicking on one. Then I'm going to click OK. So, I've clicked OK, and I'm ready to to go to the next step. So now I'm going to click on. Actually, I've already clicked on uh, the um, the. Uh, this is the selection that I just made. So, Homo sapiens, the 47k array, those 190 arrays that were specific to the anatomy that I chose. Okay, so you have to click on this on this blue arrow to get to your selection once you've selected. As you can see, it's processing the data again. So we're reprocessing because now we're we're working our way down to a subset of data from the arrays that were available. And then once this processing step stops and we're able to search more refinedly in that database, then we're going to select a target of interest. So that's what we're going to do now. So it's finished processing. We're going to select a target of interest. Click New Selection. <coughs> and now you can see we have Homo sapiens. We have our array. And now we can enter in a gene of interest. For example, let's try step 15. So step 15 is here, okay? So we go, we, again, it drops down. Each selection you make, a new arrow appears. So we have to click on that arrow. So now it finds step 15, and it finds its level of expression across those 190 arrays. So this is the, this is in all the experiments in those 190 arrays, step 15 is actually quite highly expressed, as you can see here. We could try IL-6 for a lower expressed one, just to see what happens. So, we can, so I can click here on another gene selection. And let's see how IL-6 looks. Click on that. There we go. So it's almost low to medium. But, you know, so we can see where IL-6 is. And if you click on step 15, you can see where step 15 is. Now, unfortunately, you can only select one gene at a time uh, in, the, in, in the open access version of the software, which is what you would have access to if you followed the steps that I gave you before. You can also purchase the fully licensed version of the software, which would allow you to select multiple genes at a time to see where they all express together. But let's say we're looking at IL-6 as an example. And it gives an expression range of 8.12 to 10.12, as you can see here. We can broaden that range if we wish. So we could say, okay, let's let's go let's go from 7 to 11, okay, in terms of signal intensity. And then you click Run. And what that's going to do now that the, the the database will find the most stable, the, 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 ref the genes within these 190 microarrays in this expression range that you've selected that give the, the most, uh, uh, the smallest error bars here, so that you can, so that, meaning the, the most stable. So we click Run. We'll see what sort of data we get. So it's processing, it's looking through the whole database. Sorting by standard deviation, actually. So it's looking for the ones that have the smallest. It's going to sort from smallest to highest standard deviation for the, for the genes that it comes up with. And then it's going to list them. So there we go. So smallest going up. And here are the genes. So what we recommend, and this is a very nice set of potential reference genes for your experiment. All these genes also. Uh, by this array data, at least, would express in a similar uh, expression range as this one that we selected, which I think is IL-6. So if we work our way down this list, we can actually see data associated with each of these genes. Some of them are not, there isn't much data at all, but some of them have lots of information associated with them. And if we wanted to freeze this panel, you can see at the bottom it says F2 to freeze. So I click F2. Now I can freeze this panel and I can click on the Swiss Pro number here. And if I click on this, I'm in the Swiss Pro database and I can, so you can see what what is 
all you know all, all the information that you would need to be able to design primers for this gene. You even have the, you, uh, you have the protein sequence here, and you can find you can there all the, um, the the public database references are there for you to, to also get the um, the DNA sequence as well. So interpro and prosize and everything. So there's all all the all the databases that you would need to click on to get information about the DNA sequence are here as well. All these links. You, you click on the appropriate one, you get the DNA sequence, and you're good to go. Then you can design your primers. <coughs> so let me just go back. I'm just going to, you know, and in Gene Investigator, I can now look. Uh, I can, if I click F2 again, I can unfreeze this panel, and I can look at, at another at another gene as I wish. Okay. What we recommend, or what typically recommend, is to choose reference genes that are at the high, sort of the high end down to the low end. Pick around eight or eight or so reference genes across this, you know, within this uh, this range here, the best ones, and then test them under uh, select uh, under uh, select samples from each condition of your experiment that you're doing with qPCR. So test them. Uh, for their expression levels, and then plug that expression data, the delta CT data, into either norm finder or genome to to test the stability of these selected reference genes that you've chosen across the conditions of your experiment. So norm finder and genome are two gold standard softwares that are used out there to help uh, validate and assure that the reference genes you've chosen are, in fact, very stable. But this is a good tool to at least find some good candidate targets. It does quite a bit of the initial work for you by using chip microarray data to sort for, for reference genes that are quite stable already. But uh, under your particular conditions, maybe because this is over 190 arrays of a variety of conditions, maybe under your specific conditions, some of these might not be as, as, as stable as in the, the experiments that work for microarrays. But the odds are pretty good. So it gives you a good uh, option to be able to find reference genes. So that's pretty much how this works. So if there's any questions, you can feel free to email me. And I hope this was interesting and useful for you to design your future experiments.